So, hello, good morning, oh, good afternoon, rather. Um, I'm, uh, this is Josh Sassoon. This is Tom Broxton. And um, we're designers uh, on the user experience team at YouTube. And we wanted to talk to you today um, a bit about how we design products um, in a multi-screen world. Um, we wanted to give you a bit of a kind of factory tour and a peek behind the curtain of um, some of the ways that we do things at YouTube and some of the reasons behind uh, some of the changes that you'll be seeing on YouTube in the future. Um, and then um, what some of those might look like. We'd like to give you a little sneak peek of that. So with that, I'll hand you over to Josh, and he can begin by telling you a little bit about YouTube. So just, just to um, take like a, a big picture view of YouTube, YouTube is actually a really, really tough problem to design for. And, uh, and when you think about YouTube, it's, it's probably just like up to a lot of people a place where you go for cat videos. But when you think about YouTube as a, a corpus of content, it's a huge unstructured, massive corpus with a huge breadth of content, uh, everything from cat videos to revolutions, and it really doesn't have a consistent structure. YouTube is kind of this choose-your-own-adventure experience, and it's important to look back at YouTube, or step back from YouTube, and understand what YouTube is and what it isn't, and YouTube really isn't like any other service out there. Uh, nothing like it exists. YouTube is essentially the container for the, the entire world of video. Everything is on YouTube. Everything um, on YouTube is uploaded, and it can be virtually anything. Um, and on top of that, our audience is everyone. Everyone across the world and uh, every, every demographic, everyone watches YouTube. And what's great about YouTube is it's unique in its ability to provide for this, like, this incredible universal experience. And it can also be an incredibly personal experience. It's both of those things. So uh, we have to really find a balance between that. We have, to, we have to find a way to show everyone in the world Gangnam Style. And on the more personal level, I personally am learning how to play the violin um, off of a series of YouTube videos from a creator in a completely different state. And it's very personal to me. And, and that's, that's a very different experience than the universal. So the beauty of YouTube is that there is this shared experience that's universal and it's very collaborative. If you haven't, I think everyone, most everyone's heard of the Harlem Shake meme that came up recently where not only did it start on YouTube, but it was actually because of YouTube that everyone was able to collaborate and create these videos and parody and mimic each other's videos and actually create something that wasn't there because of YouTube as a platform. And then on the more personal level, there's this really intimate social aspect to YouTube where people have YouTube parties, they crowd around a phone or a laptop, and everyone's dying to share a video with one another. So we have this, this incredible challenge of balancing, again, the universal and the personal and, and anything that can be a completely global phenomenon to something that's very much uh, social and intimate that's just your group of friends. And the end experience of YouTube is incredibly hard to describe because of that. So most people will say that YouTube is overwhelming. The, they can't really capture it or describe it in any way. It, it doesn't have enough structure or anything that's consistent enough about the cor corpus of content to really, to really capture it in any ways. And there's this common feeling amongst our viewers that they just, it's hard to decide what to watch next or how to discover something new or how to find something that, that they'll love. And on top of that, it's, hard, it's even harder for them to refine it or to collect it in, in a way where they know how to keep track of it. And so the general sentiment is, I know that YouTube has everything on it, I just don't know how to make sense of it. And that's what makes it such a, a tough problem to design for. Um, and so as YouTube keeps growing and our relationship with online video grows and changes, and what online video is grows and changes, um, we're really moving from being this web-based service um, uh, to being, sorry, web-based site to being a service running across a multiplicity of devices. So we begin to think about YouTube as a platform um, upon which um, we can uh, share content out to the world, to people wherever they are, um, and whatever they're looking at. So at the moment, um, we, we feel that we've got like a series of apps, um, uh, each focused, each specialized on their own platform. Um, that tries to take the best aspects of that platform and, and allow you to get to the content um, you know, in the way that that platform makes sense. But this gives uh, the impression, the problem with this is that it gives the impression to our viewers that uh, something you found or bookmarked or saved in one place you know, isn't available in another place, and it doesn't give a great sense of, of one service and um, one set of videos that, that you're looking on across the world. Um, so, uh, 
as we work on our next generation of product design, we're, we're really thinking about how can, we, how can we harmonize that so we can move away from this uh, sort of web first and uh, these other devices uh, second to a, to a service um, that's at the center of everything with thousands of devices and thousands of products that are, that are pointing in, into this. And so you can connect to the content you want at the right time in whatever way suits you best. And as designers, uh, we really want to provide this in a way that's um, you know, delightful and enjoyable to everyone to make that, that uh, connection experience uh, exciting because uh, from cat videos to revolutions, people tell us about these amazing and inspiring experiences that they have on YouTube. And um, it's a, uh, we really see our job as uh, connecting those people together and, and making it really easy for those kind of connections and experiences to happen. Um, so, uh, at Google, at YouTube, um, we really believe that the way to do this, the way to achieve great design that is relevant to people is to really understand the people, um, you know, understand the user and their needs and what they're trying to get out of, uh, out of things. So um, the only problem with that is, as Josh has already said, um, uh, the breadth of our audience is such that um, sort of many of the traditional methods that I, I learned for understanding um, uh, the audience that are coming to your site um, or to your service are, are quite ineffective. Um, so one of the great tools we have to address this at YouTube, or one of the great assets we have to address this at YouTube is um, a strong uh, research team who can really uh, come up with some innovative ways of um, uh, addressing the user needs, understanding user needs, and uh, finding ways to address them. Um, so they've come up with some really innovative methods, uh, especially uh, for attacking this problem of um, how things change as we move to a more device-centric world. They've come up with some really innovative ways to uh, tackle this, and I wanted to share some of those with you because I think they're really interesting, and then some of the high-level device uh, insights that we're taking away from those and, um, the, and what, we're, what we're learning uh, from, about why people use our service the way they do. So just to explain um, how this works, um, they've been running a series of large-scale diary studies where they send out these booklets to volunteers, and people record and share daily activities about how video consumption fits into their life. Um, there's a variety of exercises in the books, day-by-day um, -day diaries and these time wheels that I'll explain a little bit more in a moment. Um, and the overall uh, effect was that they gave us um, some, some insights into what people are doing during the day. So this is the time wheel diagram uh, I was just describing. Um, and the idea of this is uh, that people can record and give us insight into um, how their day works, what uh, devices they're using to consume um, media and video during the day. So here, um, the little markers show uh, where they are, what they're doing. So you can see transport, or I'm at home, or I'm at work. Um, and then uh, and who they're with as well, so we can get an understanding kind of social activity. Um, and then the inside purple ring is uh, phone activity, and you can uh, see these short phone interactions. And then we've got a, um, a tablet wheel. Uh, the laptop is the yellow, and TV is the, the long sessions that you see on the outside. Um, and then we can take many, many, many of these diagrams, and we can uh, uh, use many clever and not so clever methods of processing them and looking at uh, patterns. Uh, and try to get these patterns and, and understand the behaviors and motivations as to why people pick up a particular device and use it in a particular way um, and what they're trying to get out of it. Um, and then we can check those against the actual traffic patterns that we see coming to our site and we can see uh, you know, how these things match up and, and there's a lot of information you can draw from that kind of comparison. Um, so to begin to get to some of the insights that we're drawing out of this, uh, out of these, uh, that's just one method. There are quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of other uh, pieces that we're using. But so we try to draw all these together into some insights that I could share with you today. Um, and the, the most basic starting ones were just some device principles um, that as designers, um, we like to get down to a, uh, a sort of framework or a, a set of uh, ideas that we can all agree on so that when we talk about phone or tablet, uh, with each other as we develop products. Uh, we, all, um, we all have a sort of basic shared understanding of how these things work. So I want to share that with you quickly to begin with because it underpins a lot of what's following. Um, so I'll just go through them quickly, device by device. Um, the phone um, is sort of typified by this pattern you see in the purple there of like really morning till evening, like I wake up till I go to bed. 
Um, it's, uh, it's always with me, and it's these fast, frequent interactions. You know, people, you know how it is. You're always checking your phone. It's like you're, you're almost like a chicken pecking at the, at the corn. Um, and we noticed, but we, what we do notice is that a lot of this re, uh, uh, interaction is reactionary. So um, people are really, um, uh, uh, they're, getting status up, they're getting status notifications or updates or people are telling them about something. So phone-based inter interactions are what we're thinking of as uh, in, uh, reactionary. Um, and the other thing we really notice about the phone uh, in, people talk about in interviews is how personal it is. People are very unwilling to let their phone go. So you've got a strong chance that the kind of person on the end of that device is, is the person you think it is. Um, the only exception really to this uh, personality or the personal nature of the phone is in, um, is in child pacification, where we constantly see in these that people will just hand over any device to, to get some peace. So like, that's the one person who might be on the other end of the phone. <laughs> um, and another surprise for us was just that um, Although people often use the term phone and mobile interchangeably, we're trying to stop doing that because um, there's, not ne there's less mobile usage on the phone than you'd expect. Um, I was expecting a lot of it to be kind of on the bus or traveling. and A lot of mobile usage actually at home, like more than half of the usage we're seeing is, is from within the home. Um, so the tablet, to um, kind of contrast that, uh, it's, uh, it seems to have a slightly surrogate role in people's lives, um, and the usage is slightly unclear. Um, people often talk about using it instead of some other device, so instead of my phone or instead of my laptop or, or something like that. Um, the marked difference from the phone is that usage seems to be planned much more. People talk about downloading a movie to watch later, to take on the bus, on the train, so, um, uh, or I want to read a book in bed. Or, so it, it tends to be more uh, ritualistic and less habitual. Um, and, you know, so that's leading us to the conclusion that, the, you know, using scaled up phone UIs on the tablet is not always the best idea. The, the reason people could be using it could be slightly different. Um, and a surprising thing is people don't seem to be using them, at least for video, people don't seem to be using them as much as they think they do. If you ask them in an interview, they'll say, oh, I always use my tablet, I love my tablet. Um, and then when you look at the patterns through the day, the, the, the tablet usage is much lower than they, they, they suggest themselves. Um, the PC, just quickly, is perceived much more as a work device. Uh, usage is much more in the daytime. This is especially true with the arrival of the tablet. People, as I said, instead of, people are switching much more of their usage towards the tablet. Um, and the other interesting point we noticed, even though we think so much about living in a kind of post-desktop world, post-keyboard world, um, there are still so many organizational tasks that people can't achieve through these other interfaces that people still talk about turning back to their laptop to, as a control panel and as a device to, to, in the end, organize things and complex tasks. Um, and finally, the, the TV, uh, still sort of the epicenter of video consumption. Um, everything else seems to revolve around the TV. Um, sessions are longer, less interactive. Um, you know, you see these big orange bars, and they're, they're pretty constant through uh, all of, the, all of the research that we're doing, we see people have it on in the background. It's often associated with multitasking. You'll see like the phone or the tablet or these things being used at the same time. Um, and our important TV, uh, takeaway for the TV is really that it's a, a shared device. Um, so, you know, people are very, or it's a social device. People are very aware that um, uh, there are many people looking at the screen at the same time. So, um, you know, be careful about what you put up on the TV and, um, you know, sharing sensitive social data. People don't appreciate that. Um, there's a couple of interesting trends or sort of continuums that we notice that run across all the devices in the order that I showed them. So as you go from a small screen size to a large screen size, session length and um, really uh, the length of videos viewed increases. Um, it's kind of intuitively sensible, right? You're more likely to watch a... a a movie on the TV, um, but also interactions go down, so people want to interact less with a screen that's bigger and further away. And whereas phone is a habitual device, the way we're describing it, is phone is a habitual device, and the TV is a, is a um, ritualistic device, like people have times a day when they want to go to their TV, but they, as I said, they kind of pick up and use their phone all through the day. Um, and this, again, it seems to kind of spread according to the screen size across all of the devices. And the personal, the personal issue as well, like phone is a very personal device and TV is seen as a very social device. And, you know, tablet somewhere in the middle, I'm sort of happy to share my tablet in a way that I'm not happy to share my phone. Um, 
So uh, the second insight that really came out of this research was uh, thinking about the time of day and how people use their devices through the day. And you know, the main key takeaway underlying all of this was really just people are incredibly busy. You know, they've got these furious lives. Um, they're you know, picking up kids, they're working, they're doing all this stuff. And it's really important to fit into their schedule. Um, so when we listen to their users, we hear, um, especially with the phone, a need to be in control. You know, I want to I decide when I, I come in and go out. I don't want to be distracted too much. Um, you know, we need to, so we need to get out of their way at the right moment. And you know, the, ideally, they really want us to get us to where they want to be without them having to ask. Obviously, the less interaction they can get, the better. Um, so when we think about what they're doing when through the day, um, a pattern that emerges um, as successful is um, sort of punchy, short news content in the morning. People are quite ritualistic about uh, checking in and, and finding out what's going on at the beginning of the day. And then sort of easygoing, pushed at you, entertaining content in the evening when perhaps you want to switch off a bit more and you don't want to be constantly um, uh, making choices. So um, uh, that, that tracks by device as well. So the phone, uh, you tend to see um, these sort of short, frequent status snacking um, uh, behaviors. And UIs that work well with that uh, tend to be these more uh, feed-like UIs where I can check in, find out what's going on. You know, I want a I sense of what's going on in the world. Um, whereas uh, on TV, uh, something more static and relaxing, um, less about scrolling, more about what's the, the content that I want to be watching next, and, and you tell me. Um, so a third aspect that works when we're, helps us when we're trying to think about uh, designing these different UIs is um, thinking about the level of control and trust that um, people uh, need to have over an interface. So um, they're the they're two sort of modalities of behavior that we see, the uh, what I, I know what I want versus the kind of entertain me. Um, uh, we notice that they call for really two separate uh, UI paradigms. One end of this continuum um, we're thinking of as like trust-based and one control-based. Um, and if we think about a user's intent, it helps us to, uh, along this continuum, it helps us to design a feature. Um, and what to watch next after you've watched one video on TV is an interesting example of this. Um, on TV, we have the added challenge that you know, we've got these very limited uh, control input devices, the D-pad controls, um, and you know, combine that with this idea that we're trying to optimize for these long, relaxing evening sessions. And um, the, we really find that the last thing you want is to kind of bombard people with these horrific uh, you know, walls of choices of videos. So it works quite well on the PC or on the desktop you know, where you give people lots of choices and they can see what it is they're after. On the TV, you show somebody a wall of videos like this and they'll just like turn it off. Um, uh, it's like somebody pointed out, it's sort of like asking a kid, uh, you know, what vegetables do you want for dinner? And you know, they'll just be like, nothing, or you know, chips. They'll jump back to what they're familiar with. Whereas you, know, you might be better off asking them something like, do you want broccoli or carrots? And then uh, you know, you're kind of more likely to get a, a useful uh, reaction. And it's kind of the same with video consumption as well. We find um, if you give them the big bombardment of choice, they, they tend to react badly. If you give them a small number of choices, um, then people are much more positive about taking one of them. Um, so what we try to say with these kind of interfaces is, here's what we think you want to watch next. Um, you know, you might also like. And so we still give some opportunity for serendipity and a little bit of control, like letting people go. But uh, we're really um, concentrating on trust. And we're experimenting with different ideas and different UIs, title cards, that might allow um, more sort of insight into the set of videos that you're watching, um, such that you know, we gain sort of extra trust at the beginning of the talk that uh, you can really you can have more faith that the, the videos that are coming up are the kind of videos that you're going to want to be watching rather than giving the people this feeling that I'm just lost in this sea of, of thousands of videos. That way I can lean back and enjoy the content. The opposite end of the scale to this uh, might be um, when people really want control. And um, as I said before, like a, a, an interface that's really great for this is the phone. Um, and so... Um, we're really looking at ways that we can combine these experiences. So you might already see we've got a, uh, we've 
Uh, we've, we've already got a UI that allows you to connect uh, the phone YouTube experience to your uh, TV or to any other large screen and um, uh, let you uh, pair the two so you can send the video from one to the other. And, and these are incredibly successful at, at achieving this kind of high control, um, you know, how do I get to the video I want and then how do I share it with people. And uh, the reaction's incredible. Like people, if they can find it, people describe the experience as magical. Um, especially if you've ever tried to input a text search through using a D-pad control, you'll just know that, um, that these kind of uh, interfaces are um, light years apart. Um, and the final, um, the final piece that's helping us uh, coming out of this, this and various other research is the emotional connection. Um, so I mentioned earlier how some of the more traditional frameworks for thinking about who your users are and what they want out of your products uh, are not working uh, or don't work so well when your uh, user base grows beyond the hundreds of millions. Um, so we're really having to find new ways of trying to empathize with people. And again, the research team have come up with some pretty innovative thinking around this. And um, so rather than thinking about personas and like the type of people coming to YouTube, they're pushing us to think about um, people's motivations behind why they're coming. Um, and um, they're putting together a framework that presents content in such a way that it, it can fit to people's moods. And we, we see this as um, making it more likely for them to engage uh, with the content in a positive way. So an example I'm sort of giving here of a, of a framework we might be trying to feel out is under feeling, we've got, we, we think about people seeking a mood, following a story. I'll give some examples of that. And then learning, I guess, is more obvious. We've got a lot of educational content, but we also see a lot of how-to videos um, and reviews um, on, on YouTube, and it's very important popular content. Um, knowing we were talking about people sort of being in the know and uh, finding out what's new and popular, a lot of people come, you know, and uh, they, want to, they want to see the latest videos, so how do we accommodate those? What, what's the right UI for somebody coming in in that kind of frame of mind? And then connecting uh, is comments and discussions, but also sharing with friends, um, you know, how we, how we take those experiences back and that, you know, hopefully connects people back to the top of the circle um, where you can connect with your friends and share a feeling with them and, and then they can uh, learn and share. Uh, and th that kind of framework, it helps us build out use cases and think about what success is for a product and what we should uh, expect people to get out of it. An example of where you might apply it um, could be through language. So, um, you know, make me laugh could well be a, a phrase that is more likely to trigger a... Um, a positive reaction to the kind of content people want to connect with than, say, pets and animals, which is more the more logical place you might want to go to look for cat videos. But I don't, you know, people don't really come in looking for cat videos and think, think oh, I'll click on pets and animals. But if you say make me laugh, they, uh, they can kind of relate to that. So um, with that, I'll hand back to Josh, who's going to explain a little bit about how you can apply these, uh, these kind of lessons to design. Yeah, so as uh, Tom mentioned, we do a ton of qualitative research to address a lot of our challenges. And what we need to do in combination with that is use data and, and uh, quantitative analysis to really, to really kind of finish the entire uh, design process and make sure that we're, we're thinking about this in a well-rounded manner. So we're, we think a lot about how can database design actually help us with our design decisions when we're trying to organize and present videos to viewers. And we use a lot of analysis to, to try and figure out how can we go from something that feels messy to something that feels very intentional and something that feels organized. And within something that feels organized, how much hierarchy do we show? How much uh, density or how much diversity of content do we show? And, and a lot of our analysis on the quantitative side can really help us with that. Um, we have tons and tons of ideas as we do design explorations, but as Tom said, at the, at the scale of our user base, it's really hard to just go with your gut and say, this is going to be great, because that doesn't really work for the entire world or for hundreds of millions of people. So we really need to use data to validate a lot of our ideas. And um, this is just an exploration where we use quantitative analysis to think about how, how big is a thumbnail? How often do we group and cluster thumbnails together? How can we actually balance density and diversity? How can we show um, through one UI across platforms a nice balance of universal and personal content together and make it feel easy to understand and not overwhelming depending on what device you're using? Um, this is an exploration where we're, we're really thinking just about 
tons and tons of diversity. Just show a lot of stuff and hopefully people will make a good decision, but then we'll, we'll do another um, exploration that's similarly uh, similar, but much more minimal or much less dense. And uh, we can run these two things together as an experiment and, and, help, and through quantitative, ana quantitative analysis, we can really make better decisions about what really does work better and what leads our viewers to longer, more successful sessions um, on our product. And the, um, this is an exploration actually where we're thinking like how can quantitative analysis help us determine what layout to use? Should there be any hierarchy? And in the case of this, this is a very dense exploration that feels very newsy and has a masonry layout. And how much hierarchy should we expose at all? Um, how, how much does this actually impact our viewers' perception of YouTube as a destination that they need to come back to often as, as a news source or as a news feed versus something that feels very editorial and curated and is much less dense and perhaps only shows one to two pieces of content above the fold? And we have to think about all of these, um, all of these explorations in the spectrum and on top of all that, think about them across platforms and think how does this actually translate and become recognizable when you take that same design and you throw it onto a tablet or you throw it onto a phone? And what does that actually mean? A lot of the stuff that Tom spoke about earlier, the, the, the need for more control or perhaps more personal um, snacking on a phone is very different on, des on, on a phone than on desktop where you want a ton of options and perhaps a lot more diversity and, and even a sense of more hierarchy to help you quickly identify a type of, of content you want to watch. Um, this is another um, interesting place that we use uh, quantitative analysis, which is actually analyzing our channel creators and their content and figuring out what type of content they actually have and how we can group it together and make it more meaningful and how we can present what they want to watch next from a channel, whether it's episodic content that's meant to be viewed sequentially or whether it's music content or whether it's from a large library of videos that don't actually need to be viewed in a certain order. We've got tons and tons of creators that are making amazing new types of content that don't fall into the traditional sequential sort of show or, or movie sort of content type. So we have to really work hard to analyze and understand what our creators are doing and then find the best ways to actually present that and cluster it um, to show viewers and subscribers um, on our browse pages. So that kind of takes us to some of the explorations that we're, we're, we're taking from all of these insights and actually moving closer to a little bit of a sneak peek into how we're trying to solve the problems we've just been discussing. And some of it is just really obvious. Um, <laughs> identifying primary user needs and actually streamlining them visually across platforms and doing, doing things that actually connect our core actions in a, in a unified visual language. Something as simple as taking our subscribe button and making sure that it scales and is recognizable across platforms actually does a huge amount to help our viewers recognize and understand that when they subscribe to something, that actually means something. And when they pick up their phone after they subscribe on desktop, that that same channel and that content will be there or that they'll be able to refind it later on their TV. And that, again, we're a service and not just a site that has a bunch of disparate apps connected with it. Um, some of the other work that we're doing is just doing some basic unification, both visually and in our UI, of our navigation. Getting our viewers to understand every time you open up YouTube on any serv our service on any platform, that that navigation will actually get you back consistently to the place that you recognize, whether it's uh, the what to watch feed or whether it's a specific channel. And that kind of takes us into this, this bigger picture that, that we're um, thinking of for YouTube, like and a lot of the design principles we've already mentioned, but thinking about YouTube as this single service that transcends or, or, or goes across any platform that's easy, it has this basic underlying structure that you can understand that helps balance the universal and the personal and makes the, the experience at any, type, any time of day, any type of user, um, any type of content understandable, and then balance that with what YouTube is kind of culturally known for, which is a serendipitous, fun, kind of silly place, a place for adventure and delight, a place for potentially education and news, but also a place that is just as much a library for everything that you love in the world in video, um, as well as a place for fun. So um, to bring all of that together, I guess what we're trying to do is strive uh, for recognizability 
but not uh, be dogmatic about the consistency for the sake of consistency. We still want uh, each platform to take advantage of its, um, of its strengths. Um, so that we can get to a future that's uh, recognizably a consistent family of products living off this uh, one service in the center uh, that optimize for the strengths and opportunities of each and really give people um, the right content for the right device uh, you know, at the right time of day, uh, lets them get in and get out when they need to, and uh, remember, remembers where they are when they come back. And that's, that's okay. it. Thank you. So we even left a little bit of time for questions, if anybody has any. And if not, there is a page for feedback. Um, so if you want to give feedback, you can um, uh, scan the QR code, or I, I think you can get to it through the site. And it's all gratefully received. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Just, just one question oh, about um, the, the options you presented earlier, the, uh, the, the, the variants of, uh, of the teasers you put on the, on, on the YouTube um, 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 main page. What's your criteria to, to, to say if it's successful? Is it just click-through rate? Is it, is it um, how long the user stays after he clicks one video? What's, what's the main goal on this first on the start page? Do you want me to start? Um, sure. I'd, it, definitely, it varies from exploration to exploration. I mean, the, both of those two things are, are very interesting to us. The immediate click-through rate that uh, uh, the effect that changing something on the site has is definitely interesting, but also, of course, the, the longer term, like does it lead to a longer number of clicks? Uh, does it, you know, what, what are the kind of videos that leads to viewing? How does that affect the relationship of the viewer with the creator of the video you know, behind it? So I think it, it, I say there's, it's difficult to think of one common thing, uh, but the common principle would be to make sure that we understand those in advance of running the experiment, right? Um, it's far too easy to run an experiment and then like look at a bunch of numbers and, <laughs> and uh, try and uh, pick out the winner afterwards. Yeah, it's, I mean, right now it's really, it's hard to, to come up with a good success metric because we're looking for longer term behavioral change. We want, we want people to come to the homepage and make a better decision instead of just watching something and abandoning it right away or watching something that may lead to some other series of random watches. We'd rather people get really invested and understand what they're watching and, and depending on the context, watch it you know, longer if they're in a, in a place like on a device where there is the potential to watch it longer or at least have a high quality session where, where they make it through the video and they make a good decision. Uh, a question about the a dual screen experience that I, we, haven't, we haven't seen that. How do you guys think about uh, basically designing a dual screen experience where you use a tablet to control what you see on a, on a TV? I, I lost the end of your question there. As we design a dual screen experience? Yeah, how do you, how do you go after you know, designing it? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> I think um, a lot of our uh, initial impulse is driven out of the frustration we see with search. So you're, if you look at our TV experiences, you'll see the, the, the dual screen experience promoted a lot from there because that's where we see the biggest advantage for people when uh, they're having frustration typing in controls. So I think that's, where we, that's one of the places where we started. Um, and then really thinking about the other, the other part of where it came from was really thinking about, as I say, like all of the services, all of the products working together off a common service. So um, rather than trying to build specific remote control apps as we'd seen other people do, we were trying to think about, well, you know, I, I really should be able to search for my content anywhere and play it anywhere. So um, that was sort of one of the underlying principles of the, of the UI we were trying to develop. And not develop new apps, but, but think about, okay, we've already got a mobile phone app and we've already got a TV app. What's the best way of, of connecting these two together? And, and how do I really want to, you know, how do I really want to use these two things? I, there's a, a sort of famous use case for YouTube, right? We all know about where you're, you're, everybody's got a video that they want to show everybody and, uh, uh, you know, so everybody's waiting to queue up and play their favorite video. So that was sort of one of the underlying motivations was um, 
you know, how do we uh, make that really easy? So if, I've, if we can all find that video on our phone and play it on the TV, that's a, that's a great win. Um, there are, it's, I'd say the difficulty is balancing all of the, the different use cases together that don't always interact that, the way that use case works next to, oh, I've just got a, a playlist that I want to put up on the TV and leave running during a party. The two can be kind of in conflict with each other. Any? So wanted to ask, um, do, you, do you have any, when you're designing for cross-device, are you having any of those devices drive what the rest of the devices are looking like? Are you starting from the phone, bringing it to tablet and elsewhere? And then do you, do you feel like you're compromising on some of these devices because of your trying to maintain consistency? Like, is this truly the best tablet experience, or is it the best that you can do with consistency? Right. So, I mean, I, I came from designing for desktop for almost two years, and so it's really easy to fall into this pattern of, like, every feature exists on desktop, so we're just going to try and, like, wedge it into, like, mobile or figure out how does that work on TV. And the reality is, is, like, we just make, we make really concerted decisions to, like, constrain and say, we're, we just don't need to do half of these things for certain devices. So we've really started to reapproach some of our newer projects from thinking about, you know, how does this start with mobile? How does this start on the tablet? How does it start on the TV? And really starting to think about desktop as an equal um, instead of the first thing we think about. And so it's actually like a, a pretty interesting time for us right now because we, we're, we're doing all these explorations and granted many of them do start with desktop. We're, we're actually making sure that we put mobile or tablet on an equal playing field in those explorations and say, what do you actually really need when you're, when you're staring at your phone? And 99% of the time, all the things that we do on desktop don't translate exactly or, or even necessarily need to be there. So again, as Tom said, we're, we think about like familiarity. We're not trying to just make it absolutely consistent. We just want to make sure that when you're looking at your phone and your desktop, like you feel like you're using YouTube, but the thing that you really need from the phone is very different from what you need on the desktop experience. So, I'd say just to add to that, that's definitely part of the motivation that was driving a lot of the qualitative research that we talked about. Because I think it's so easy to have um, an assumption of knowledge. Like we, we have so many learned patterns from so many years of building a, a very large website. Um, that we wanted to really immerse ourselves in, in think, the ways of thinking of people using other devices. So it was, that was part of the driver behind that project. So if, if you were going to add a new capability into the YouTube service, where would you start? Would you look across and say, okay, I'm trying to design simultaneously across all of them, or do you have one that you would start and then try to loop it back around? Some of the new features we're thinking right away about how does it work across platforms. And so it's kind of... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of overwhelming because we're trying to do it all. Um, and we'll see, we'll see how that works. But I think a lot of the explorations now start with mobile, mobile and desktop, and then, and then TV is kind of the next thing we think about. I just wanted to touch on some of the user research um, that you guys have been doing around uh, kind of how people watch TV on a large 10-foot experience. Um, do you see the need to have TV kind of be this like painkiller slash sort of zoning out use case uh, dwindling with kind of co-viewing applications and ha all the research that shows that people are just spending an increasingly large amount of time actually doing stuff while they're watching TV? Like whether it's just being on Facebook on their phone or Twitter, mm -hmm. it just feels like less of a relaxing use case, and I'm just curious how that might change yeah. your perception of what it's about in that 10-foot experience and how that changes the UI. I agree, and uh, yeah, we've definitely seen the same pattern. I, I, at the same time, we sort of do, I, the latest research we're doing just seems to suggest that the TV's on sort of more, and in a more passive role, you know, it, it, the more it's, the, the, it's used at the same time, the more, um, we see the two things going on together, the less interactive and the more background role that the TV seems to, seems to gain. Um, yeah, but then I, I, I think um, that the rise of these, um, these dual screen applications may change that a lot. I think they've got a long way to go. I was at C CES earlier this year, and you know, just everybody's throwing out these sort of dual screen apps, and I think there's gonna be a kind of madness of them for a while. 
But, and so how that affects what's appearing on the main screen while we all like play with our iPods um, you know, is, is interesting, but um, uh, I, I can't predict the pattern yet of how, of how that's going to evolve. Okay. And I think, uh, I think we're running out of time, so I think it might have to be the last question. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>